Hello everybody and welcome to Heartlight Vedic Astrology. Today I was going to discuss uh, Vedic Astrology or Jyotish analysis for the eclipse that's coming up, solar eclipse that's coming up this Monday. It's also known as a Surya Grahan in Sanskrit. And uh, the date of that solar eclipse is the 8th of April 2024. So it seemed like the um, overall energy for that moment in time is changing of the guard. Mm. So let's get into it. Uh, note beforehand, the information presented here is for educational purposes only. It should not be considered medical, financial, professional, or life advice of any kind. If you are in need, please contact an appropriate professional for support. And then you might take a minute or two to read the rest of this disclaimer. If you're new to Vedic Astrology, uh, Jyotish are my videos. All of my teaching videos on the subject are my concepts playlist. They can all be found there. And wherever you see a double asterisk in one of my talks, that means there's a teaching video on that subject if you'd like to learn more. So since this is an interpretation video, I incorporate a lot of different concepts. And so um, these are some of the uh, other videos, uh, teaching videos, that might be helpful to you to get more out of this talk. So the first one uh, is lunar and solar eclipses, Chandra and Surya Grahan, obviously, because we're dealing with a uh, eclipse coming up. Mm -hmm. And that video talks about the astronomy of the eclipses as well as the Vedic uh, significance and recommendations for, um, you know, uh, dealing, you know, handling the energy of an eclipse. Like, uh, it's very much in contrast, I think, to Western astrology or... Uh, for example, uh, this solar eclipse that's coming up on Monday, they're calling it the Great North American uh, Solar Eclipse. And um, I was just talking to some one of my neighbors, and they said uh, people are like, you know, um, people are traveling um, to different places so they can get a good view of the solar eclipse. And so, like, hotels are getting bought out and things like that. So um, that's in direct contrast <laughs> to what Vedic astrology would recommend. Uh, you know, the contrast of Vedic astrology is. Um, especially when a, an eclipse is going overhead. And actually the eclipse, this particular eclipse that's coming up, is actually almost going over my head. Uh, it's going right over uh, very close to New York City, and I live close to New York City. So, um, so uh, yeah, uh, in Vedic astrology, like, for example, if there was a temple where I live, I just, I'm guessing the temples around here, if they follow Vedic astrology, they would actually close down. Um, even like uh, religious services and things like that, because they feel like um, thought is that the Rahu and Ketu, the north and south node and the moon, bring too much chaotic energy. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, it's a different point of view, clearly. But other videos, uh, you know, to uh, get more out of this talk, North, South, and East Indian style charts, uh, I do include Western charts um, in that video, but it's not part of the title. Um, introduction to Navigating a Birth Chart. Introduction to the constellations of Rashi's, constellation of Rashi categories, planetary aspects, natural benefic and malefic planets or grahas, chidra grahas or planets of vulnerability, planetary exaltation and debilitation, ichabunga, karko bhavanasha or planet breaking house, and bhavat bhavam, house of the house. Uh, nakshatras is a big one uh, with my videos. Uh, those are lunar mansions. Uh, Parivartana yoga. Uh, is, you'll see a bunch of those today. Um, the symbolism of each planet. So I have a whole playlist on the planets and grahas, and each particular I have a video on uh, each video, uh, each planet. And so for this uh, particular talk, you want to look at Rahu, Ketu, Moon, and Sun because those are the planets that form a uh, lunar solar eclipse. And then I have a growing playlist of houses and bhavas uh, symbolism. I've got most of them now. I've got a few more to do. But, um, you know, if you're not familiar with the symbolism of each house, uh, that would be a good playlist to look at. And I would start with the Lugna video, which is the Sundant Rising Sign or First House. All right, so some background stuff for you if you don't, if you're not now, if you don't have this knowledge at this point. All right, so let's take a look at the solar eclipse chart here. <clears throat> Uh, the Surya Grahan. So again, this is 8th of April, 2024. And um, this is going to be happening uh, about 14 to 21 in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. So that's this time zone I live in. Excuse me. Um, the Day Lord is Moon, and the Hora Lord or the Hour Lord is Saturn. So um, you can already see from this. Um, 
Uh, the moon is a very emotional planet. It's a very intuitive planet. Um, and uh, Saturn can represent like sadness, duty, delays, obstacles, even things like chronic illness and death. So, um, and the moon, which is the ruling planet for the chart, because we have a Cancer or a Karka or a Blugna here, um, has gone to the ninth house, which is a Dharmasthana, a house of duty. Okay, so I'm seeing here, just with these two planets, uh, sadness and duty. Okay, um, then we have the Shah period, so this is the planetary period. And at this particular moment in time, there, it's Mercury, Rahu, Mercury, Jupiter. So Mercury and Jupiter are both the education planets, but they're also the speech planets, communication planets, and uh, like media planets, like news and that sort of thing. And you can see that Jupiter and Mercury are together in the 10th house of, well, it can be career, it can also be fame, um, it can also be like the activities that we do during the daylight. So this is going to be a, you know, looks like some sort of daily announcement or um, you're going to maybe even famous announcement. Um, and the thing is that part of why I put shocking here as sort of a descriptor is that the, skipping ahead a little bit, but it's important for the whole kind of tone and just for the chart, is that the rising, um, the Lugna nakshatra, so the nakshatra or lunar mansion for the rising sign is a shlesha. The shlesha is symbolized by a snake. And, um, you know, as, as snakes typically, you know, behave, um, sometimes they can kind of slink away into a cave, but a lot of times they'll kind of rear their head and they might kind of strike out very quickly. So that's the kind of shocking point. Um, I've seen the other thing about Shlesha is that, you know, like snakes, it has this kind of mesmerizing energy. So I could see where there's some big news announcement, you know, um, that's coming out that's going to be kind of shocking and sudden and also like um, mesmerizing, like it's going to catch a lot of people's attention. Okay, let me back up a little bit here. Um, so the Dijon period for this moment in time, again, is Mercury, Rahu, Mercury, Jupiter. But it's switching to Mercury Rahu K2 on the 7th of May of this year. So, you know, Rahu and K2, again, we're talking about a solar eclipse, and Rahu and K2 are essentially what create eclipses. And if you did watch the video, my video on Rahu and K2, you'll know that these planets bring, you know, they're called shadow planets, um, Chayagrahas, um, because they're not actually planets, they're actually calculations. Um, but um, they have a great effect um, on, on many things, and they can overshadow the two great luminaries, the sun and the moon. So they have a lot of power, and the energy with them is, you know, about suddenness, um, unexpectedness, hiddenness, mysteriousness, um, that sort of thing. It can include things like uh, mental illness. It can include things like you know, illnesses that are hard to diagnose or cure. You know, that sort of energy comes along with Rahu and K2. So we're going to get more of that, actually. So it looks like there's going to be some sudden shocking announcement um, around this time. And then uh, we've got the work through it. Um, and you can see in this chart, a Mercury and K2 are in the third house of written communication and kind of physical expression of things. But it's also the third house of siblings. So, and then uh, Rahu is in the ninth house. Rahu and Ketu are 180 degrees apart from each other. Rahu is in the ninth house of authority, leadership, father. Uh, this could be like guru, it could be like religion. Um, and so you can see, and also you can see that there's the, you know, moon, sun, and Rahu, uh, Ketu on the three nine axis here. We've also got an exalted Venus here. Um, you can see the arrows going back and forth. And then you can see Mercury, even though it's in the 10th house, it's 36 uh, minutes here, not even a degree, and it's going retrograde. So within a few hours of the solar eclipse, Mercury is going to be joining the mix here. And Mercury is debilitated in Pisces, where, you know, uh, Moon, Sun, Rahu, Venus are currently. Um, which will, you know, so Mercury is destabilized here by being what we call Sunday in the first or last degree of a sign. Um, it's retrograde, which gives it strength. Um, 
So we actually have an exa what we call an exaggerated mercury. It's both strong in some respects and weak in other respects. And then once it gets into Pisces, it's going to be debilitated, which is going to bring weakness. But we've got the exalted Venus, which will make it bunga, which will break the debilitation. Not that it'll break it completely, but it'll bring up Mercury. Um, and then also, as soon as it crosses the line uh, into Pisces, Mercury's going to go combust. So we're going to have a very exaggerated Mercury. So um, I would imagine this is going to be a very exaggerated speech or announcement or news, which is already like, you know, another layer of this, uh, you know, Jupiter, Mercury, you know, the shop period and the Ashlesha energy already coming up. Okay. Um, and since Cancer, uh, the ruling uh, Rashi or constellation for this uh, chart, um, is a movable water sign. Movable means a lot of action, and yeah, water is emotional. This is this is some some sort of announcement here. It looks like related to authority, and a written, especially a written communication, um, is going to have a pretty shocking effect. And you know, it's there's going to be something you know again because of Ryan K2 involves something unusual, shocking. And a lot of times, if you watch my video too, a lot of a lot of things that happen while eclipses are going on, you can get world records being broken, like in sports and stuff like that. Like you know, I don't know, a World Cup that people will never forget. Like something happens in the game, like the score, or the you know, the the way the players happen, or the weather, or something that's just like unusual but like uh, noteworthy, you know, and, and uh, makes it stick in your memory, and people will talk about it for a long time. The other thing that tends to happen during eclipses is you get <laughs> um, the birth and transition of a lot of um, uh, royalty, like monarchs and stuff like that, kings and queens. Um, and since we're looking at this big eclipse that we're having here is in the ninth house of authority, you know, already that's kind of moving my mind in that direction of some kind of turnover of authority here, especially because if you look at these planets, even when you get Mercury in here a few hours after the eclipse, Mercury's going to be combust. You can't see it. Moon and Sun essentially are combust because that's essentially what a solar eclipse is. The moon blocks out the sun. Um, so you can't see the light of, you know, light from the sun or the light reflecting off, you know, from the, reflecting from the sun off the moon. Rahu you never see because it's a shadow planet. So the only planet in this group of five that you can see is this exalted Venus. Venus is a feminine type of energy. We typically, you know, analyze like you know, women here. Although I don't know, that might change. You know, again with the current. That's more from a classical judge's perspective. I haven't gone too much into this, but <clears throat> you know, we might be talking about a feminine type of person. The other thing is that the the signs that are uh, even. So you know, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Those have more of a feminine energy. And the odd numbered uh, Rashis or constellations, you know, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, have more of a masculine energy. So we have four, you know, eclipsed, you know, hidden planets. Um, and it's not that they're gone. What happens, though, is that deep within, you don't see the external manifestations of these planets when you get eclipsed uh, planets, but you feel the energy more deeply within. Okay, so we have four, basically four eclipsed planets with this, you know, exalted Venus, a very, like, um, you know, in the house of authority. So I could see a very, um, you know, uh, amazing, like, you know, notable woman uh, stepping forward into her authority. And I think, again, we're talking about, you know, to a certain extent, and some looking at the general chart here, like a collective energy, female empowerment here. Um, you know, rising to um, their own inner royalty. But I think this can also be very literal, which is what I'm going to talk about more of as we go through. So um, then we have the moon nakshatra here, the lunar mansion of the moon, which is in Revati. Revati is, and uh, so uh, the four planets that are going to be combust here, Mercury, Moon, Sun, and Rahu, are going to be in this Revati nakshatra. So four out of nine planets are in Revati. Revati, luckily, is a gentle type of energy. It's about um, hospitality and traveling, but it is the last nakshatra of the last constellation. So it also brings this energy of endings. 
Yeah. Now, in the context, you know, sort of, you know, world social context of this solar eclipse happening, um, we have the beginning at the night of the same day. Uh, we have Navratri beginning, which is a Hindu um, kind of festival. Nine, it min literally means nine day and uh, nine nights. Um, nine nights of honoring different versions of the goddess, so honoring women. So you can see, like even the social context, worldly context, you can see the, like the energy, you know, um, um, building up here, right, in a certain direction. The other thing is that Eid is being celebrated by many people around the world. Um, so that's the end of Ramadan. So there's typically like you know kind of feasting that goes on after the month long fast. And the, you know the general kind of notion about Eid is celebration after sacrifice. And so again, when I see this like massive, you know, you know, such a contrast of this massive exalted Venus with these four debilitated or not debilitated, but combust planets with it, you know, this is like, you know, I just see like in my mind, like this, almost like in the movies, like some woman warrior, like warrior leadership person, but who also has a lot of compassion because Pisces is an emotional um you know, it's a water sign. It's a dual water sign, and and Venus represents like compassion and sociability and diploma diplomacy and stuff like that. Like some, just you know, shining female figure that's stepping up in their authority. And so, you know, with all of this, though, it hasn't been easy because Mercury, Moon, Sun, right? There's a lot that's had to um, have been let go of. Or sacrificed uh, that this woman had to, in order for this woman or women to uh, gain this, um, you know, title here. Yeah. Um, also, uh, the solar eclipse was happening in between Easter and Passover, two other big, you know, religious holidays going on um, at this time of the year. Um, Easter and again, Easter is again about you know resurrection after death. And that's, you know, that fits with this energy, you know, the four, you know, eclipse planets and Venus here. You know, some star, you know, shining luminary figure in this dark time. Because again, like, you know, even if you just think about it literally in the sky, if Mercury's combust, it's too close to the sun, you can't see it. But the sun is combust, you know, eclipsed from the moon, and the moon is dark because the sun is, you know, the sun's blocking out the light of the sun, or the moon is blocking out the sun, light of the sun. Rahu, you never see. So the, you know, the shiniest thing that's going to be in the star is this, you know, is the planet of Venus. That's what's going to grab your attention, and that's what's grabbing the attention of this chart. Um, you also get more emotional energy because you have the moon. You have the moon and Venus there. The two uh, emotional planets, the moon represents the intuitive mind, and again, Venus is like, you know, the heart. Yeah. The other thing is that when Mercury joins the party here, Mercury and moon represent um, the two planets of the mind. So Mercury represents the ran rational mind, whereas moon represents the emotional mind. So not only is there like a physical changeover that's happening here in authority, but there's a mental changeover that's happening here. A deep a mental change, mental shift. Okay, and then um, so Easter is about resurrection and Passover. I think you could take this literally when you look at this chart of you know this whole like protection and um, you know like they put the what is it the markings above the door you know so that you know the kid would be saved and stuff like that. Um, I'm getting the sense that again from whoever this woman figure is, um, despite their glorious nature. <laughs> You know, I, and glorious is not a word I use very often, but that's what I'm seeing here. Them standing up in the midst of this, like, dark time and leading forward with compassion and strength um, and thoughtfulness um, and even, um, you know, I would say spirituality, that in the past they may have been passed over um, despite their okay. skills, talents, natural abilities to lead in this um, grand capacity. Okay, so uh, let's go through, that's what I usually do with these charts is go through uh, house by house and see what we see. Um, so the Lugna I mentioned is a Cancer, Karka, rising sign. It's a movable water sign. 
Sorry, I'm trying, trying to stay hydrated here so I can get through this long talk. They tend to be long. Um, so in Sanskrit, that's charge. All I mentioned movable is a lot of activity and water is emotional. So whatever this changeover is, this moment in time is going to bring a lot of emotions. Okay. Um, and the Lagnatia, the Lagnatia is the ruling planet I mentioned is moon. Moon is eclipsed and it's a new moon. Even if it wasn't eclipsed, it's a new moon. So it's going to be a weak moon. And this weak moon has gone to the ninth house, uh, which I mentioned is a house of duty. And it represents things like authority and religion and um, uh, father, that sort of thing. Um, and I mentioned all these things. So again, the four planets, Mercury, Moon, Sun, Rahu, are going to be in Revati. And again, I'm including Mercury in this mix because it's like literally going to be in the mix a few hours after the the solar eclipse. So there's going to be plenty of solar eclipse energy kind of embedded or influencing Mercury. Um, uh, and the thing is, this exalted Venus is in Uttar Bhadrapada. Uttar Bhadrapada is symbolized by a um, this, uh, back legs of a funeral pyre. So, you know, again, if we're talking about Indian culture, the uh, funeral pyre is all about, like, you know, death and destruction. But the Uttara Bhadrapada is different from Kurva Bhadrapada, which is the nakshatra lunar mansion before it. Kurva Bhadrapada is just, like, really destructive, chaotic, you know, energy turnover. Uttara Bhadrapada is like a conscious release, like a conscious letting go. Think of it that way. So it's not as destructive, and it can actually... you. When you get a lot of, um, you know, important planets at Uttara Bhadrapada, this might be like even like a, somebody who meditates or like a religious renunciate or something like this. So, again, this exalted Venus person or people, um, it's a conscious, you know, conscious release of perhaps their old identity. Because, again, this moon is going through massive transformation and moon is, is the... Um, uh, you know, ruling planet for the whole chart. So it's like, you know, willingly going into this, you know, sudden and unexpected mass, I would say massive change of authority. Okay. Um, within oneself and then, you know, if we're not, you know, if we're talking about individuals and if we're talking about like society, you know, we're talking about you know, potentially you know, governments of countries and things like that. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned most of this already. So the other thing is that even though I keep talking about Pisces here, because you can see all these like, you know, this conglomeration of five out of nine planets, you know, building up in Pisces. The thing to remember, you know, is that on the opposite side, all of the, almost all these planets are aspecting their energy into the opposite house, which is Virgo in the third house. And so you won't get Rahu, uh, you know, Rahu doesn't aspect like that. Um, you know, to the opposite house. Um, but you have Ketu there, which is the south node of the moon. And Ketu is in a nakshatra of Hasta, which is hand. Okay. It's symbolized by hand. So with Ketu, it's a very erratic uh, energy of this planet. Um, it's very, it can be very explosive. Um, and uh, so with Ketu and this hand symbolism, I could see somebody either grabbing control we're actually even being handed control suddenly. Like, again, this could be like some unexpected figure. That's the energy building. It's some unexpected figure, probably female, um, who's suddenly being given control where it wasn't expected at all. And this person, again, this third house person, which again is the house of siblings, um, uh, has to go through this massive, you know, internal transformation to step up into this uh, position of authority. Okay. Um, so just know that, you know, even though I'm talking about Pisces, there's just as much, you know, you know sort of shift and change and transformation happening in the third house here of Virgo. The other thing is that Sun, to add more, you know, <laughs> you know, sort of uh, chaos to the mix here, or more, you know, clarification, you could say. The sun here in the ninth house, that's what we call a Karko Bhavanasha. That's when a planet representing a certain person is in the house representing a certain person. So the sun represents the king, president, 
and it's eclipsed, so you can't see the king or president. And not only that, but you know, the when you have a Karko Bhavanasha, it usually indicates that there's you know, issues or difficulties going on with that planet or person that's being represented. And um, so there are issues, problems, you know, with the authority, you know, the head of a government, corporation, household, father, literally, you know, it could be your own father. Um, and the thing is, again, the ninth house is the house of authority. So even more so, it looks like there's a transition here of authority. And that's why, you know, I said, uh, you know, changing the guard, you know, in terms of the overall theme for this moment in time. But again, it's going to be unexpected. And then the other thing that's unexpected, you know, maybe in terms of timing is it's going to be unexpected who steps into the, who steps into that role following the person. Because it looks like there's some turnover here. Um, and it may not be like, you know, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be like, a, you know, something really final, like a physical death or something like this. But because of all this kind of cushiony edge energy of moon and Venus and Pisces, and it's like a graceful trans, even though it's sudden, unexpected and maybe shocking, it's still a graceful transition. So, and it's done with thought. So it might be that, you know, if somebody, if there is an authority who maybe is ill, for example, they might be thinking, like, how do I pass on the baton in a way that's going to be the best, um, you know, moving forward for, you know, all the people involved as well as the establishment and then whoever is being governed. Yeah, that's what I'm saying here. Um yeah, um, so trouble with the king. And then the other thing, so as if there's not going, enough going on, then Venus is, a, is in a Bavat Bavam. So Bavat Bavam means house of the house. So you can see that Venus is the lord of the 11th house here. That little two in the corner that represents the second constellation of the zodiac, which is Taurus or Vrishaba, and that's ruled by Venus. Excuse me. So the 11th lord has gone 11 houses away. So that means, you know, there's going to be like multiplicity of, you know, the 11th house represents multiplicity of clubs, groups, and societies. That's the first thing I think of. So I can almost see with sun being, you know, Karko Bhavanasha and eclipsed, moon being eclipsed. So, and the moon represents the queen. So sun, you know, it could be literally that both the um, king and queen are shifting position or authority here. Um, uh, so anyway, the Venus, uh, the clubs, groups, and society, I could see where this could actually be like a funeral procession was what I see here. Moon is, you know, uh, eclipse, sun is eclipse, uh, Mercury is combo, Strahi can't see. And then, you know, this, you know, I could just see like, you know, like a procession, all these different clubs and groups and people and stuff like that, you know, paying homage to, um, you know, who was there before. Okay. And this doesn't necessarily have to happen. Again, this is a conscious thing. So it doesn't, you know, this turn handing over the baton doesn't necessarily have to happen like on the day of the solar eclipse. But the solar eclipse energy will usually, you know, formulate, you know, again, depending on different people's charts very quickly. It could be very suddenly like on the day of. I mean, that would be very dramatic. But again, this could also be over the next few, you know, weeks or months. And based on this chart, I'm guessing at least over the course of April, there should be sig some significant shift here. Um, and the other thing is, since we're talking about, you know, Mercury, Rahu, Mercury, Jupiter as a Desha period, what I could see with Mercury and the way it's moving. So currently it's with Jupiter, Jupiter and Mercury together in the 10th house of kind of you know, overt daily acti like activities that happen during the daylight. You can see it's shifting, you know, within a few hours of the solar eclipse. So it's going to go into the ninth house. So that communication planet um, is going to be in the ninth house of father, so talking about people, and it's going to be aspecting the third house of siblings. The other thing is Mercury is currently in the tenth house, but it's also aspecting the fourth house of family lineage and mother. So what I'm seeing here is that with Mercury being so close to the line, the inside people, like mother, father, um, siblings or whatever, are, are probably being informed. 
you know, of of what's going on here or what's going to happen or what's attempted to be happening here because it looks like it's a conscious transition. Um, then Mercury is going to be in, in the ninth house for, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever. And then it's going to start moving forward. And especially when Mercury goes back to the 10th house with Jupiter, that's, I think, when there's going to be, you know, a really big um, announcement. So it might be more internal communication that's happening right now, especially because Mercury is going to be combust. You won't necessarily see the communication that's happening. Now, it might be you don't see the communication because, again, it's like a little bit of buzz in the inner circle of who makes these decisions and what needs to happen. Um, but the other thing is it could be like, um, you know, like digital communication, especially because it's aspecting the third house of written communication. Um, so that might, you know, it might be like blasting all over the internet is what I'm seeing here also. Um, but the timing might be like right now, it's the, when Mercury's uh, almost combust, uh, it might be, again, the inner circles talking and making their moves. And then at some point, you know, the news is going to, you know, send shockwaves around the world. That's what I'm seeing here. Uh, um, yeah, so also to note about this chart, the Chidra Grahas, or Grahas of Vulnerability, so we have Venus um, is a triple Chidra Graha. So that's going to be a lot of vulnerability when it comes to relationships for, again, if we were talking about a specific person. And then the other one is Mercury. So whatever this Venus-Mercury situation in the ninth house is about is a very touchy situation. So again, that might be part of the shock and awe, you know, kind of energy that's coming through at this moment in time. Um, the other thing is that um, with Moon being in, or the Lugna being in Athlesha, um, and it being a weak Moon, um, I could see this being like a, you know, sad, sad um, home, sad public, um, that sort of thing. Um, losing a king or a queen, funeral possession, some of these things I mentioned. But the other thing to note is that this um, exalted Venus is also the lord of the fourth house of family line. So there is, you know, preservation of family line here, family lineage. And that could also be like spiritual lineage, but, you know, the, the people who've been like sort of evolving together, you know, like in the river of time. So despite the, you know, kind of shock and awe of this, it looks like, you know, the power is still going to be kept in the family, but it might just be an unexpected member of the family. All right. Um, then the second house, if we move on. So the second house, this is a North Indian style chart. First house is the top a diamond, if I haven't mentioned, with that little four in the corner. That four represents the fourth constellation, or Rashi of the zodiac, which is Cancer, <clears throat> Karka in Sanskrit. To get to the second house, you actually count counterclockwise in North Indian style charts. So the second uh, house is the upper uh, left corner with the five in the corner. <laughs> so um, the second house represents family. Um, it represents uh, assets, uh, movable assets. It represents speech. It represents inner, you know, inner circle. And uh, we have aspecting the second house. We have um, well, first of all, <laughs> before I talk about the aspects, the Lord of the second house is this eclipsed sun. So, you know, it's like the whole family, there's going to be like a, you know, cloud, if nothing else, cloud coming over the family in terms of the shift. So again, it looks like we might be looking at a royal family here. Family of leadership you know, a strong kind of prominent family in the community, even if it's not like actual royalty. The other thing is that Jupiter, the planet representing uh, communication and publication is aspecting this house. And oration, you know, in the second house is oral communication. So there's some oral communication that's going on in the inner circle. The other thing, <clears throat> the, other, uh, the other planets are aspecting the second house are Mars and Saturn. You can see them circled uh, together here. <clears throat> 
um, in the ninth, uh, eighth house, the eighth house represents deep psychology. So Saturn represents like tradition, longevity, um, structure. You can see Saturn is massive. It's very strong. It's in its own um, constellation of Aquarius. So Saturn's very strong. But you can see Mars here is is coming up on Saturn. They're almost within a degree of each other. So a couple days after the solar eclipse, Mars is gonna you know go into a planetary war with Saturn. And Mars is the rebel. Mars is the innovator. Mars is the you know throwing the monkey wrench into the system. So there's gonna be a clash of new guard and old guard <clears throat> going on here. And this is also happening happening deep in the psychology. So again, I think of probably all the people involved, but especially if this is a native person, deep in their mind, um, uh, you know, again, because this looks like a long-term prominent family, um, powerful family, um, where there's going to be a shift in leadership. And this person is coming to terms with, you know, however this plays out is not with what people expected. It's almost like... Um, you know, if somebody, you know, uh, there's a family and, uh, you know, maybe the father passes away and a will, will is read or something. And people, and, you know, like in the movies where people are sitting around and they're like, oh, obviously so-and-so is going to get everything. But then it's like, no, that person gets, you know, diddly squat. And then everybody, <laughs> you know, and somebody else who's like the dark horse or like a totally unexpected person gets everything. It's like that kind of move. Yeah. Um. So anyway, this, so this, Mars Saturn clashing energy is also aspecting in the second house. So there is again, like I mentioned, with the way Mercury's moving, there's first going to be this clash in the family of like power dynamics shifting, you know, like the like the ground shifting beneath what people, you know, their feet because things aren't going to go as expected. Um, and then there's going to be communication about it, at least in the inner circle. And again, it looks like um, in a public way, but it looks like the inner stuff is happening first. Uh, so, you know, people's jaws aren't dropping like on camera or something like that. Um, yeah. So that's the second house. What do I have here? So like literally since the Lord of the house is this eclipse sun and sun is, you know, in Karka Bhavanasha and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, we're talking like family ties and maybe even money disappearing. Because again, if this is a prominent family, it may mean that like assets are being shifted in different directions and people expect it or counted on. Um, yeah. So then the third house, the Lord is uh, the Sunday Combust Mercury. <laughs> uh, but Mercury's in Ashwini right now. And that's why Ashwini is about, you know, is a kind of a rescuing energy. It's, um, symbolized by the Kumara, Kumari twins, uh, who are celestial healers. So there's this usually like, um, you know, uh, healing, rescuing, being first energy and that sort of thing. So it may be this Jupiter and Mercury in the 10th house might be like a publicity, like um, especially prominent families and stuff like that. They're probably very, uh, they're, most of them are very conscious of their public um communication and reputation and image and stuff like that and so it's like um with as something as big as this i think there's this sort of idea of um you know trying to contain or salvage whatever you know the collateral damage might be from this announcement of a shifting guard um k2 i mentioned is in hosta so that's going to be you know unexpected twist in the story it's aspected by Moon, Sun, Venus, and Mars. So not only the planets that are, you know, shifting in the ninth house, but then you have Mars. And K2, as I've mentioned before in my videos, is like a is also is like Mars, but with even more of a twist and unexpected energy. And um like Mars with K2, I've mentioned in my videos, is it can be a very uh, explosive, if not violent, energy when they're aspecting each other. And you can see Mars is also not only is Mars gonna get into war with Saturn here. Um, but Mars is actually going to be in the exact degree of K2 um, a day or so after, a day or two after this. So so not only are Mars and Saturn going to be in planetary war, but in the middle of that, Saturn is going to be aspecting K2. So again, there's going to be this like explosive energy in the third house. Um, but the thing is, um, Mars is also a leadership planet, as is Sun. 
So you've got the two leadership planets aspecting their energy into the third house of siblings. Um, so this Mars and Saturn thing as well, um, Mars and Saturn are both uh, boomy karakas, which are um, plants that symbolize like land and property. So there can, there's like a shakeup here. It's like Saturn in its own sign. It's like this um, almost like rock or concrete, I kind of think of. And Mars is like fire. And like literally here where I live, uh, uh, we had an earthquake uh, yesterday morning, which is quite unusual for, you know, New York. But, you know, again, we're in solar eclipse times. So, you know, the only thing I tell people about, you know, usually the only thing you can expect during eclipses is like the unexpected. So we had an unexpected um, earthquake yesterday. So that's like this Mars-Saturn edging together. And I can imagine over the next week when Mars and Saturn are going through this and Mars is going to cross Saturn and Mars is going to aspect K2, um, we're probably going to get more earthquakes or at least aftershocks and stuff like that here. Anyway, that's the local story. Um, so yeah, so there's a big shakeup here in the third house of, again, written communication as well as um, you know, siblings. Um, and the thing, though, too, is that actually with Mercury, when Mercury gets into Pisces, it's going to aspect to the, you know, this third house of Virgo. And even though Mercury is going to be Sunday in the last degree of Pisces, and even though it's combust, it's going to bring strength, some strength to that house just by aspecting into its own sign. And it would be an inner strength because Mercury's combust. You can't see it. So, um, Again, I just see all this kind of like, you know, shift of energy moving to the third house of siblings. Um, what else do I write here? Yeah, especially with this sun, moon, you know, combination here. This could be like a formal written decree. Um, and again, an unexpected handover of power leadership. And I, w I would think here, like the sibling is a dark horse. Because even though the transits here you know, or like all the planets are, you know, kind of harnessing their energy and sending it, you know, a lot of it to the third house of siblings. You know, K2 is like a, can represent people who are kind of, um, you know, a bit separate, distant, um, you know, doing their own thing. You know, um, again, kind of a dark horse energy here. Um, and especially when you get Mercury aspecting its own sign, I've also talked in my videos, when you get mass, Mercury aspecting its own sign, whether it's uh, Gemini or K2, or Gemini or Virgo, I often get, I often see like people's interest in like meditation and Buddhism and stuff like that. And I think that's like, you know, kind of like this Venus and Uterba drop it, or like this conscious like um, release or sacrifice. Because I don't think the sibling was expecting it. Um, but like if that's what's being called for because you know the current leaders need or want to step down or whatever like that um it's like them gaining courage and energy to one be like oh is this for real you know just like uh, you know kind of accept uh, this opportunity and then step up in that role so that's what i'm seeing here in the third house um because the third house also represents courage so even though sun you know, it was eclipsed. Uh, that's a fire energy. Um, but Mercury there, again, I think will give this person the inner courage they need to step up into this role because it looks like it's pretty massive, whatever this role is. Um, yeah, so that's the third house. Fourth house, uh, we have Jupiter and Mercury aspecting here. Um, Jupiter's in Barani nakshatra. Barani is represented by a womb. So <laughs> Jupiter represents like life and expansion and stuff like that. But you could see with a wound, like a childbirth and stuff like that, there, you know, in order to birth a child, there's usually a, a, some sort of loss or death that happens as well. And it's a, a, a turnover, it's a cycle, like the cycle of life. And so, again, the Jupiter and Mercury, it looks like there's a family announcement. But the announcement, like the decision that's being made here, I think is being made, even though it's probably going to be disruptive and, you know, shocking or whatever. I think this person is, is doing deep reflection here and going against tradition because they really believe that this is the best thing to actively um, maintain and continue the family line and the honor of the family line is what I'm seeing here. Because again, the, the Lord of the fourth house is this exalted Venus. That's the only thing kind of visible and standing in the, in this, 
you know, want to see a solar eclipse energy. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the fourth house. Um, the fifth house, the fifth lord is this Mars, and, uh, you know, and it's, um, it's, you know, going into war with Saturn and going to be aspecting K2 exactly, you know, in an exact degree pretty soon in the next few days after this. And Saturn is aspecting uh, this fifth house here. So, and the thing, the thing about this chart and generally is that you can see this mass of Saturn is with Mars, and they're both going to be destabilized through the war, but Saturn is going to like override, um, you know, is, is going to like influence highly Mars. But the other thing is that not only is Saturn on Mars, the planet, but it's on both houses that um, Mars owns right now. So Saturn owns Aries. So if Saturn is aspecting into Aries, and um, Mars also owns Scorpio. And Saturn is on both those signs. So for all the Scorpio, Lugna people out there and Aries people out there, you're probably going to really feel this shift, at like a, almost like a earthquake within yourself and identity here because of, you know, this mashup coming up in the next week. So, you know, take deep breaths, you know, and, and you know, uh, walk through it best you can. Um, the other thing is that, you know, this... Uh, well, I'll get to the tenth. I get more to the tenth house, but so the fifth house represents a uh, stage. You know, it also represents creativity. It also represents children. So, um, and Saturn is the, uh, the planet of, of death and chronic illness, but also delays and obstacles, anxiety, skepticism, that sort of thing. So, this mass of Saturn is both on the ruler of the fifth house of children, as well as the house itself. So I think this is like a big stop sign for the children if the children thought that they were going to be stepping up into this position of authority. I think I think the football is going to go lateral here instead of, you know, um, to what may have been the, the next in line or what people thought were the obvious next in line people here. And that's going to cause some anxiety here. Yeah. The other thing is that, you know, if we if we flip that, we flip the chart to the fifth house so that Scorpio is rising, that means that this like, you know, you know, bomb that's going off with Mars and Saturn in Aquarius is going to be the fourth house of the the kids. So this is like, you know, breaking with tradition and the fourth house not only represents the family line, which is happening for the kids, but it's also the fourth house represents happiness. So, yeah, I don't think the kids are, you know, that might also be, that it might also be because, you know, the if there is a parent who's passing away, that might be it as well. But again, beyond, beyond the grief that may be happening for the kids because of parents or whatever, you know, authority is not being passed to the kids here. Authority is being passed to the siblings. So it might be one and the same, or it might be two different issues here. But um, yeah, the kids are um, gonna have some uh, difficulty here. Um, the other thing is that the fifth house represents counsel. So uh, if we again look at this chart as a specific person, this cancer person, their thoughts are going really. Deep. There's been a lot of deep reflection here, and a clear, clearly conscious choice to break with tradition is what I'm seeing here from their fifth house of intellect and, you know, the top, you know, conscious part of their mind. Then we have the sixth house here. The sixth house here is, uh, the Lord is Jupiter. Jupiter is in Barony. It's aspecting its own sign, so that's going to help. Um, the sixth house represents things like uh, enemies. So Jupiter aspecting its own sign, um, that's going to help. And I think, again, what this person is trying to do, because they know that this is, it's going to hit the fan. <laughs> like, you know, they know it's, this is going to be a mess and they're trying to, you know, uh, make this as graceful of a transition as possible, even though it's unexpected, but, you know, people, some people are going to win and lose, or at least in mind, that's the way they're thinking about it. So it helps that Jupiter aspect its own sign. That's going to, you know, again, um, smooth off some of the edges. Um, but again, Jupiter's in Barani, so it's again about, you know, cycles of life. There's going to be turnover here with, there are probably going to be new enemies and old enemies here, even though 
The other thing is that Jupiter represents truth and justice, and the sixth house can also represent things like legal issues. So part of what may be going on here is that um, in order for this, you know, lateral pass to happen to potentially a sibling, some sort of uh, legal issues, like again, again, if it's like a personal thing, like a will, but if it's like a dominant family, this might be literal, like, you know, um, ownership of businesses or something like that, like more, a lot of legal stuff has to happen in order for this transfer of power to happen. That's what I'm saying. But, you know, with Jupiter there again, you know, it's truth and justice that whatever's happening here is it, they're trying to do it in the, in the most just and truthful and fair way. Um, it's trying to bring generosity to acute troubles. The, four, the sixth house can also be like acute troubles and illnesses and stuff like that. Um, so, but new cycle of life, and it could be literally like new law if like the family is prominent to be at that level. So yeah, um, let's get into the rest of the chart here. Okay, so let's look at the other houses here. So then the seventh house, well, the seventh house Lord is the Saturn that's, you know, strong, but, you know, it's going into, um, uh, you know, planetary war with Mars. Um, the other thing is that I don't think I mentioned, um, so Mars and Saturn, at the time of this record, or actually as of yesterday, they just actually, Saturn just shifted, but yesterday, Mars and Saturn were both in Shatabisha Nakshatra. Shatabisha Nakshatra is uh, translated as 100 healers. So this could be like, um, you know, there's a lot of medical type energy here, like things that are generally that are hard to diagnose, hard to heal, um, things that take a lot of, you know, effort um, to heal. And especially since Saturn and Mars are two malefic planets in the ninth house, this could be like deep mental troubles, um, or troubles with the, you know, OB guy and GU type system. Um, but the thing is that, um, Saturn just moved into Purva Bhadrapada, and Mars will be moving into Purva Bhadrapada in the middle of the planetary war that's happening next week. And I mentioned that Purva Bhadrapada is the front two legs of a funeral power, which is a very destructive and chaotic energy. So again, um, the war, you know, all the things that Mars and Saturn touch, it's about, um, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, letting go, a death of some kind. Even if it's not like a physical person or something like that, it's like a, a loss or transition of something, you know. So anyway, the Lord of the seventh house is the Saturn, um, which is in planetary war. Um, the other thing is that when you get Mercury, I have in here this green dotted line going from Pisces to Virgo, and that's the aspect Mercury will have once it shifts into Pisces. It's not quite there yet. Um, and when Mercury goes into Pisces, um, because Kate, uh, the, the Lord, the Dispositor, or Lord of the Rashi constellation, Katie's in his Mercury and Mercury's aspecting its own sign, then you can get five and nine aspects away for K2. So K2, the dotted gray line from the third house to the seventh house, that's K2, the five nine aspect you'll get once Mercury shifts here. Um, uh, so K2 again is this like, you know, um, grabbing, you know, of power or letting go of power, depending on which way it goes, um, because it's in hostile right now, but the, tenth, the seventh house lord is a Saturn, which is very challenged, and you have this K2. So there's going to be like a massive, like, I would say, loss or letting go of the stability of, you know, um, again, if this is a partner and their spouse, this could be business partners, this could be business, like letting go of the business. And again, if this is a family, this is a family business or tradition here. Yeah. Um, what, what did I write here? Remove the power from the spouse. That could very well be because again, if the spouse's power is related, it only comes through the power of the you know the native here. Then, if the native step downs, and then they also lose their stuff too, right? So. Um, remove power from the spouse, shattering ground loss from beneath the feet. So the spouse is going to be feeling it here. Uh, the eighth house, I've been talking about a bunch, uh, Saturn and Mars. So break with long held and also mental ideas. I didn't really mention that part, but Aquarius is like a, you know, air sign. So this is all about like ideology and stuff like that. So 
the tradition is like the thoughts, the sort of ideas that are held, have been holding this tradition, not necessarily the physical stuff. So that's what's really, the, the seismic shift that's happening here is more on like a mental ideological level. Um, but I mentioned deep internal war shift for both native and partner, death, chronic disease, that could be, you know, part of what's going on. Um, but it's affecting, you know, a lot of things here. Um, the ninth house I've been talking about a bunch. Um, I didn't mention that there's also with these four planets and then, you know, five when Mercury joins the party. This is a Pravraja yoga, so it's a life focus. Um, yeah, and uh, the most powerful planet here will be Venus, clearly. So if you watch my video on that, um, you can learn about not only Pravraja yoga generally, but when you have a Pravraja yoga, which is like a certain number of planets all kind of conglomerated like that, strongest planet will give you an idea of the um, labor um, of life focus. Uh, but this is basically, I think I've covered most of the things in the ninth house I've been talking about since the beginning. The tenth house, um, Lord is Mars. So, and the thing is, Saturn is aspecting here where it's debilitated. So again, there's going to be like a rocky, shaky, like news and media coming from this. So, you know, I think, again, if this is a person, they're trying to, you know, lay out the story, <laughs> lay this out as clearly as they can, because they know that there's going to be, you know, skirmishes going on. And so, but there's still going to be rock and roll going on in the news, it looks like, uh, from this. I could see even like chaotic flood of first speech, like who's going to be first to like make the announcement, like almost like a newspapers and tabloids type of thing. Um, I can just see a flood of this kind of stuff happening. Again, not only um, now, but even over the next few weeks. And because again, um, Jupiter's going to be in Aries until May 1st. And Mercury is getting back there. Uh, it's going to, once it goes progressive again, it's going to get back to Aries. And it'll be there, I don't remember, at the end of the month, I believe. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's, um, again, just a, a lot of communication and news and stuff is going to come from this. The 11th house, I sort of mentioned, the exalted Venus is the lord here of the 11th house up of both the public, you know, clubs, groups, and society. I think that it's public if you're looking at this from like a monarch point of view, clubs, groups, and societies. Um, and then you have this Mars, you know, that's going through this war and, you know, being highly influenced by the Saturn aspecting onto the 11th house. So whatever happens here is going to be like, you know, really rocking public. And um, again, I think what's happening here is there's a break with patriarchy specifically. Because again, you see this exalted Venus, which I keep thinking woman um, in my head. Um, it may not be, but, um, you know, at least more of a, the choice, the choice here, even if it's not a woman, is somebody who is quite diplomatic and emotional, but yet strong um, and charitable is the choice here, whoever it may be, male, female, you know, gender, uh, but at least a nurturing energy here. Um, and then, well, um, yeah, and then the 12th house is this, uh, the Lord of that is this Mercury, which is going back and forth and Sunday and combust and all this sort of thing. Um, because Mercury so erratic, I think what I was seeing here since the 12th house represents like loss and stuff like that. Um, and also, you know, foreign places. I think this is going to be like potentially a media leak and or just like news, you know, traveling around the world about this. Because again, if this is a, you know, a monarchy, well, that'll be news, right? Um, I think the other thing I didn't mention is that you do also have a Saraswati yoga here um, in this chart generally. Um, it, that's the placement of Jupiter, Mercury, and Venus. Um, and so I think, again, uh, Swaraswati um, yoga energy brings both education as well as arts, arts, like an artistic creative. And so, again, I think that there is like a clear effort here, knowing that the decision that's been made, even though it's the best decision, it's going to, you know, throw a lot of people off. So they're really trying to orchestrate here some way to make this transition as, as smooth and graceful as possible, even though it may not be entirely possible.
All right. So, and then typically what I do next uh, in my, uh, you know, moon videos, uh, full and new moon videos I do every month, and eclipse um, videos, is I typically go through the amshas, which are the subdivisional charts or micro zodiacs, and go through, um, you know, that. And again, I kind of leave it where I keep going back to the natal chart, assuming it's just sort of like a general kind of collective energy. But because everything was so uh, stacked up here in a certain way, uh, where my mind went to when I started analyzing this chart was um, there is a certain monarch out there um, who is a Cancer rising. Um, and I thought, this is basically a transit chart for them. So, yeah, I guess my intuition was kind of leading me there. The energy of the chart was leading me there. And so I decided to actually, instead of go through the Amshas, um, you know, in a general way for a collective energy, I decided to go through it for that monarch. So um, let's talk about who that is. <laughs> and you might already have some idea, I'm guessing. Okay, so who is that uh, person? Well, let's start here to start getting some clues. Um, probably already have some, but here's some more. So whenever you look at our, an eclipse uh, chart, you know, you want to look at um, the eclipse path, um, you know, and that'll qualify uh, the eclipse uh, because where the eclipse is seen visibly, um, there will be more of an influence of the eclipse um, on people generally. So you could see this is the eclipse path for April 8th. And you can see this like kind of red, orange, kind of snake-like energy over North America. Um, that's the eclipse path that's happening. And you can see New York is under there, close to where I live. Um, so you can clearly see that most, the most visible uh, places or the places where the eclipse is going to be most visible are essentially Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And we got into the... We have different islands, right, in the Atlantic and the Pacific here. The thing, though, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I was looking at the list, because this is, the, like, the main chart when you go to, like, time and date. This is where I get the information for the eclipse paths and stuff. Because I was looking on the list here, and on the list of countries, they gave more specific energy. But you can see the tail end of the eclipse is very close to the U.K., and so there will be a partial solar eclipse happening, um, BST, I assume that means British Standard Time, um, 7.52 to 8.51 British Standard Time. So, um, yeah, so the monarch <laughs> that came to mind is, da 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 da, -da drum roll. Yeah, so the monarch uh, that came to mind was actually King Charles of the United Kingdom. He is actually a Cancer Rising. Uh, he has a Cancer Rising chart. So um, I started looking at his chart to see how this uh, solar eclipse uh, may be affecting him. But yes, all right, that's so what I've been talking about. So, so we have on the left here. This is a solar eclipse I've been going through, and the information I've uh, I presented already. Then on the right here, we have the chart of King Charles of the United Kingdom. Um, he was born on November 14th, 1948, at 2114 p.m. Uh, British Standard Time. Uh, he was born in London. I should uh, make sure I change that. Um, hold on. Yeah, well, I'll change it later. Hopefully I'll remember to change it. Um, and uh, the Day Lord was Sun, and the Hural Lord was Mars. So <laughs> we've got the two leadership planets here. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, potentially uh, military, right? So his birth to Shah was K2 Rahu Moon. And you can see from his chart that um, he was actually born on a lunar eclipse. So as I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, that typically happens is that a lot of, like, royalty and things like that are typically born during times of lunar and solar eclipses, so that is true for him. And um, Rahu and Moon, you can see here, are in the 10th house of daily activity. Um, so there's ambition here, uh, mind is here, um, the, you know, the mental focus is here. The other thing is that Sun, uh, even though it's debilitated in the 7th house here, 
or excuse me, in the fourth house uh, under uh, seventh constellation of Libra. Uh, sun aspects uh, the 10th house where it's exalted. So, um, you know, and the sun again represents um, the king. So he's had his mind and focus on that from birth, literally. That's the energy he was born into. So um, the current Desha that King Charles is experiencing is Jupiter's son, Venus. So the other thing, um, before I keep going here, a lot of the, you know, the aspects and stuff I put in here, um, the circles I put in King Charles's chart are basically showing how much his natal chart um, is very close to the solar eclipse energy. So let's go around and do that first um, yeah, before I get too far ahead. Um, you can see Saturn here in the second house, um, aspecting into the eighth. So you've got Saturn on the two eight axis here. Yeah, deep psychology as well as family. Saturn in his chart is in Maga. Maga, <laughs> Maga is uh, the, this. I'm laughing because the symbol of that is a throne. So royalty and ancestors, those are energies, soil, you know, and leadership associated with that nakshatra. So he comes from a long line, steady line of um, ancestors of royalty. Um, you also have uh, Venus. Um, it's in the third house, but Venus is again on the three, uh, nine axis here. The other thing is you have Venus and Mercury in a Parivartan exchange of houses, so that means you can bring Venus or sorry Venus into the fourth house and Mercury into the third house. That means Mercury is also again on the three twelve axis or three nine axis here. You have, so basically, you have Venus and Mercury on the <clears throat> three uh, nine axis again. So recreating the current sky pattern, or the you can think about it the other way: it's current it's current sky patterns you know, recreating a King Charles' chart. And again, you know, I've circled here K2, Mercury, Sun. <clears throat> You've got another eclipse going on. Uh, Mars is uh, sitting in the um, fifth house here. So, you know, this is fifth house represents children. Mars is, you know, Mars can be like a military. And both of his kids, uh, you know, went into the military. <laughs> You know, leadership of different kinds for the kids here. Um, but Mars is aspecting, again, as it does in the current sky pattern, Mars is aspecting the uh, eighth house of deep psychology and the 11th house of uh, clubs, groups, and society. So again, you get a recreation of Mars and Saturn in the uh, eighth house here of deep psychology for King Charles. Um, we have Jupiter, uh, back in the, uh, sixth house here. It's sitting in the sixth house, but it's aspecting back into the, the tenth house. Okay. So, um, you have Jupiter, <laughs> Jupiter and Mercury aspecting, uh, the tenth house again, bringing energy to the tenth house again, as it is in the current sky pattern. I mean, it's like, kind of like, almost like, ooh, you know, like. <laughs> Like, kind of uncanny how much similarity there is between King Charles's chart and the current sky pattern. And you do also get Jupiter again aspecting in the second house. So you get Saturn and Jupiterian energy in the second house. So you can see, you know, that's, I think, part of why King Charles is experiencing some of the things he's experiencing. Like, we know in the news he's been having some health problems. And uh, that's also not to... Um, um, surprising, uh, given the similarity between the current sky pattern and his chart. But you can also see this big, uh, pra he does have a Prabhraja Yoga in the fourth house. So, you know, family is a life focus for him, you know, preserving the family here. Um, but you can see sun is Sunday. It's in the last degree of the sign. That's going to destabilize the sun. The other thing is sun is um, debilitated in Libra. And sun represents, you know, father. Um, but it also represents generally the health. Okay, and not only that, but <laughs> sun represents the central nervous system. Mercury, uh, which is you know conjoined with it, mercury uh, represents the peripheral nervous system. 
Um, K2 can represent, you know, unusual diseases. It can also represent things like, um, you know, strange infections like viral infections and things like that. Um, so, you know, this could, this could be for him, like, um, he's, he might have a lung issue. I don't know for sure, but it could even be like at this point for him, um, because he's running K2, he might be having problems on breathing because mercury also represents lungs. This could also be um, long-standing issues from COVID because he did announce at some point that he had COVID. Um, the other thing is K2 can be um, something like um, a gross, like cancerous type gross, that sort of thing. Um, I didn't really want to go deep into his health history because he's not announcing things. So again, I don't want this talk to become you know, tabloidy type thing. Um, uh, but, you know, just generally in his life, he's going to have uh, poor health. Um, the other thing is that Saturn is aspecting, you know, the fourth house, um, which will bring some stability here because the planets here are not super stable. Um, uh, but uh, Saturn is exalted in Libra, so that'll be some strength to this potential um, you know, health situation. The other thing is this Parivartana between Mercury and Venus. Venus will come back to its own sign. So you have two planets kind of bolstering this fourth house of one mother, of you know family lineage, of happiness. But you can see that there's going to be a lot of ups and downs. You know, it's going to be a Ferris wheel or carousel ride of fourth house for him. So, um, but anyway, uh, he is clearly dealing with, you know, he's announced that he's dealing with health issues. But getting back now, just to do like, a, and I just want to do a little bit of a general rundown of his chart, you know, to kind of orient you to it. Um, but then I was going to, again, specifically look at this issue of transition of leadership. I didn't want to do a deep dive in his health because, you know, again, I just thought that was, even though he's a public figure, it just, you know, it's a private issue and there's, I'm sure, a lot to manage personally. And, Professionally as well for him, but um, anyway, so his current dasha is Jupiter's son Venus. So his son, again, we have this you know debilitated son, so health issues for him. Uh, Venus will be supporting here, and again, Venus is in the third house of siblings, so he's got the support of you know. I'm guessing this is Queen Anne, his sister, um, who's supporting um, him and his health right now, or being quite supportive. Um, and then Jupiter here, you know, he's got his eyes on, you know, um, formulating um, new law here, I think, um, for the transition of power. So um, I, I don't know. In the news, I read something like maybe he has a couple of years more left to live. But I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it's a tablet thing. It's just a headline I read. I don't know if there's any truth to it. But um the thing is that because of maybe his age as well as his current health status, he might be thinking of, he might not have anticipated that the transition, his transition um, as you know, monarch uh, would be so short-lived. And so I think he might be really thinking about, you know, um, if his health declines um, sooner than he anticipated, He's only been in the throne, what, like a year or something, a year and a half? Two, I don't know if it's even been two years. Um, how he would want that to go. Um, the other thing is that first in line for the throne for the British monarchy is Prince William. Um, Queen Anne, who, again, I keep going back to siblings and stuff like that. I think Queen Anne would be... I think Queen Anne would be... Um, somebody that will be brought forward in an unconventional way. I'm not saying that she would necessarily step into being a queen. I don't even know if that's possible. I don't know the rules and regulations of how that works. But, um, you know, uh, Prince William challenged his wife also has health issues uh, going on. They have three young children. I'm not sure he anticipated stepping into becoming king so early, but, um, you know, that's how things go sometimes. But it might be that uh, Queen Anne is going to step up in some way, I think, formally, because I think all these changes uh, with the monarchs and stuff like that, I think it has to be gone through and passed and okayed by the parliament. I think, I think that's how it goes. Um, 
But again, um, I think that's where his mind is at, is how do we mitigate, you know, the one, you know, the upfront kind of skirmishes, you know, and things that are going to come out of this unusual transition of power. And it would be unusual to transition, not necessarily full power, um, but more power um, to Queen Anne, um, at least for the short term. Um, because I was looking, I think she's like number 17 in the line of succession. Because it's like Prince William, then his three kids, then Prince Harry, then his two kids. And I think there's like another kid on the way. And then I think it's like Prince Andrew and his kids. And so, and so Queen Anne is, or I call her Queen Princess Anne, is like number 17 on the list. So to bring her up, you know, and, and put her more in a leadership role would um, be, I think, a big deal in a lot of ways. I mean, legally public i think the public would be you know shocked maybe not so shocked maybe not so shocked because she's been like a steady worker and we're going to get into her chart um but again i i think she might be the person sort of dark horse to come out of the situation to lead and kind of be again i don't know if she's going to get full reign or not but she may even be kind of like a extra supporter. I almost kind of want to say training wheels. I don't want to diminish her role at all, but to help assist um, William, um, give him a little bit more time or support um, when he eventually fully transitions into the role is what I'm guessing here. The other thing is that this Jupiter, um, Jupiter thing, you know, uh, in its own sign, and it's sixth in the sixth house here. Again, that's law. With Venus being so prominent, again, women is coming to mind again, and sun is leadership. And then again, with Venus being um, exalted again in the ninth house of leadership, again, we're getting the same thing as the what our solar eclipse chart here. So this may actually be because, again, I think the reason why Queen, you know, I keep calling her Queen Princess Anne is like number 17 is because of the old, you know, laws about, you know, a patriarchy and stuff. And they did, ch and uh, Queen Elizabeth changed that law before she passed away so that uh, Princess Charlotte, I think they call her Princess, right? Princess Charlotte, I think she's like seconds. So I think, what is it, Prince George and then Prince Charlotte, these are uh, Prince William's kids. Prince George and then Prince Charlotte and then Prince Louis, right? Is that the order? So if the all old law still applies, like Charlotte's out of the mix, kind of like what happened to Queen Anne. Queen Anne, I keep calling her Queen Princess Anne. So um, this may be like a, you know, almost like a reversal of fortune because as far as I know, Queen, I keep calling her Queen Anne, sorry, Princess Anne. See, um, she like I think she's known like as like a workhorse. Like she does more engagements than any other working royal in that family. Like and she's done it quietly and she's done it with grace. And um when we get through her chart, um I think she's really quite good at what she does in terms of really upholding a very noble and kind of old school tradition, you know, kind of the best uh, version of what royalty can produce and give to itself and society, I think that's what she represents. Again, I don't follow the British monarchy. I don't know, but just the little bits and pieces that I've read and you know, seen through the years is that she's just quietly doing you know, a massive, a massive amount of work and, and a massive amount of a great job. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so when I look at the current Deshaw for King Charles, you know, new, new laws with women leaders, you know what I'm seeing here? Um, and that might be the, you know, the, the twist in the story here. Um, the Lagna Nakshatra's Pusha, that's a very emotional, stabilizing energy. So, um, you know, again, that fits with the solar eclipse energy that's, you know, there's a conscious decision of how to pass on the baton to make it as graceful as possible. Um, the moon nakshatra is an Ashwiti. So there's also this, you know, notion of being first and being competitive. I think that's part of him and his training, knowing that he was going to be king all these years, you know, decades now. Um, uh, but there's also this like rescuing energy with him. So I think he, you know, especially because there's this Prabhraja yoga for him, 
you know, the Pravaraja Yoga for him is in the in the house of family and family line. It's not in like the seventh house of independent business. So I think, you know, he's always been very clear about this is a family thing and preserving the family and family tradition and honor um, more than like a corporation of, you know, how do we spin this and how do we create more, you know, merch, you know, merchandise and stuff to sell and cups, you know, with the queen's face on it or whatever and t-shirts with, you know, um, that's not what they're about, um, or at least that's not what he's about. Um, but he, there's always been like a, you know, ambition. There's been ambition for him, for sure, to be king. Um, but, you know, I think it's tempered by, um, he does have, I think, um, um, a lot of um, uh, good intentions as well, I would say, from this chart. Again, I don't know him. I don't follow the British family. But from this chart, um, I think he has good intentions. And he's willing to, again, um, you know, break with tradition if it means that it's going to be about preserving the family line, which, again, if his health is deteriorating, that's what he's currently doing. Um, the other thing, oh, yeah, like this Mars and Saturn energy in the 11th house, or not the 11th, but with the, in Aquarius in the 8th house for him, this could even be something like um, 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 a call for surgery. Like, I think they did mention he had prostate surgery recently because the 8th house is, you know, that you know, uh, sexual organs and uh, genital organs and also urinary tract and, you know, that, that sort of thing. So he, you know, from this mix here on his chart, he will have surgery. The other thing is this Mars and Saturn here uh, in the eighth house. This could also be, I think, because um, I think he's undergoing chemo, Mars represents chemistry um, besides surgery, and Saturn could be, again, um, some kind of growth, which again could be the surgery and chemotherapy for the prostate um, growth that he had. But they did say he has cancer, but what type of cancer they didn't mention. Um, and he's being currently treated for that. But I could even see this being like, um, um, especially the chemotherapy deteriorating um, his mental status. And so he might still be clear of mind enough to know that things are deteriorating for him. That's a possibility, and so that may be why he's kind of preemptively thinking about um, making this move, um, before he may not be of sound mind and body to make uh, better decisions for the future of his family. Um, the other thing is, I mentioned he was born on a lunar eclipse, like quite a few months ago. He's got the Pravaraja Yoga. The other thing is, he has a Ritika Yoga here. This is the Mars and its own sign here. Um, so Ritika Yoga is a yoga of power, and uh, so, you know, his kids have that, uh, well, but it's especially Mars here, um, that's more of like a military kind of leadership, because um, you can see the sun here is debilitated, even though the sun is exalted when it um, aspects into Aries, the primary position of the sun is debilitated here. So um, that could also be like almost like a setting, like sun setting, you know, and um, loss or shift because uh, Mars is in um, Scorpio. Scorpio is a very transformative energy. So uh, Seth House not only represents his children, so Prince William and Prince Harry, but um, it also represents his intellect. Um, uh, and so he can be, I think, hawkish at times. Um, that's in contrast to his uh, Lugna Nakshatra Pusha. I don't think he always goes that way. Um, but the other thing is Mars is in the Nakshatra of Jesta, which is a protective energy. So again, I think when he does get his ire up, it's um, to protect. It's not necessarily that he's uh, an aggressive person. He's trying to like you know grab everything he can. Um, he may do so in terms of his family and his born into position, but I don't think that he's, um, you know, somebody who's just trying to, you know, like a Genghis Khan type of leadership. That's not what I'm saying here. All right, so that's a little bit of background on King Charles. But then what I was interested in looking at in King Charles' chart, or his subcharts were, um, given the current sky patterns and his current, current Desha, so Jupiter, Sun, Venus, um, uh, what... Um, 
what did his microzodiacs look for for both children and siblings? Because again, that's what I was seeing in the solar clip chart of like, you know, siblings being preferred as the um, sort of the preferred choice of uh, stepping into power over children. And so I was going to see, um, look at the uh, zodiacs uh, for him to see if that jives or not. So let's see. So these are the sub-zodiacs for King Charles. Um, again, the Deschamps period for him, Jupiter, Sun, Venus. So these are going to be the planets that are going to be you know, active. And these sub-zodiacs here, again, they're mostly used for timing of things. Um, I know some people, I've seen some people that they do kind of a full analysis here. Um, and again, the sub-zodiacs are mostly for timing. It does give some nuance. It adds nuance to the natal chart, but you always want to bring your information from the Amshas back to the natal chart. So the first chart here for him at the top is a Subtumsha. This is a D7 for children. And then the second chart here is a Drake and a D3 for siblings. So I just wanted to see, based on his Deshaun period, Jupiter, Sun, Venus, which of these charts was a stronger chart in this particular moment during the solar eclipse. So the seven here, you can see Moon and Venus are not well placed. Okay. Um, and the reason why I put uh, Moon here is because um, he's moving into Jupiter Moon um, in his next planetary period. So, um, yeah, I put that there uh, to see like what's kind of coming next. So after Jupiter Sun, he's going to go to Jupiter Moon. So Moon and Venus are not well placed. Um, so actually, uh, and we can see here Jupiter is debilitated. So Jupiter is, even though it's in a positive house, it's not particularly strong. Um, and the thing is, the 11th house is the public. So this may be that, you know, the children are having a hard time with their you know, communications with the public, which I think are actually is probably true for both um, Prince uh, William and Harry. The sun is exalted in the uh, second house here of family. But, um, you know, this could represent, um, you know, King Charles himself. Um, I'm not sure this is, um, you know, their own power because the, you could see that the Lord of the Lugna, the Lord of the whole chart is Jupiter, which is debilitated um, in the 11th house here. So I think, you know, overall, uh, the kids during this J Jupiter, Jepsha for King Charles are going to have uh, problems with uh, communicating with the public. Yeah, and in the media for things that they probably don't want to be in the media about, right? All the tabloidy stuff, right? Um, uh, the thing, too, is even though Sun is um, exalted in the second house, so powerful family leadership, you know, monarch family and father, um, Saturn is uh, exalted in the eighth house and aspecting directly um, the Sun. And Saturn is. Um, one, it's um, uh, debilitated in Aries, so that's going to bring the sun energy down. The other thing is that Saturn, in the uh, Amsha analysis, um, there are different uh, planets that are sole enemies of each other. And this isn't the same as planetary friends and enemies in the natal chart, so don't confuse those two. But Saturn is the sole enemy of sun. So... Uh, yeah, I think the you know the father might be prominent uh, for the children right now, right now. Um, but you know also that's the shift in the uh, mental status and health status of what this father's going through. I think that's why the sun is kind of lighting up right now. But again, uh, once you shift to Jupiter Moon, then you're going to have uh, the Bukti is going to be. Um, in a negative house, even though it's exalted. So there's still be, going to be some protection. But but essentially what I'm seeing here is that during this Jupiter, Sun, Venus, to shop period for King Charles, this is not a particularly strong time for his children. Um, even though they come from a royal family and they have a powerful, fam powerful father, they have the pedigree working for them. But um, there are, I would even say, um, challenges, if not skill sets, that are not... Uh, really strong here for the kids, okay? 
Now, if we look at the Drake end of the D3 for siblings, so this would be like, you know, potentially um, Prince Andrew and uh, Princess Anne. So moon and sun are not what well placed. Okay, there are negative signs here. Um, but the thing is, is that um, we qualify those. So actually when the sun and moon are in certain positions from each other, we get what's called a, a Shib Sankhya Yoga. So it's a combination that actually lifts the combination. So even though sun and moon here are initially not looking positive or great, um, there is a lift here because there are positions where they are from each other. The other thing is that moon is in a parivartana with Mars. So Mars can go to the sixth house of enemies and, and moon can go to um, the Antwa position in the ninth house of leadership and authority. And moon is a female energy and Mars is a male energy. So this is like a swapping of male and female energy from, you know, enemies and uh, to power here. So um, the moon is much, um, even though moon initially, if you just look at it as a negative house, you can see the moon has a lot more power to it. And so the next Asha is going to be the Jupiter moon period. So there is going to be this like shifting into uh, authority here. On the siblings of King Charles, so you know Andrew and uh, uh, Prince Andrew and Princess Anne. Um, the other thing is that Jupiter, the main Mahadasha, is exalted, or not exalted, is Swa in the second house here. Um, so a lot of charitable energy here and power in the second house of family, which you would imagine in a royal family. And the other thing is Venus is also in its own sign in the seventh house of independent business and partnerships here. I mean, this is a massively, you can see, if you compare the D7 with the D3, you can see that the D3 is massively stronger than the D7. Um, yeah, and you could see too, like this Jupiter in its own sign in the second house. This is like adept at speaking, um, charity, um, the uh, Venus and the and the in its own sign in the seventh house adept at building relationships. Not only do the siblings have this like you know pedigree here, but I think the skill set that they have is a stronger skill set than what the kids have here. Um, so in terms of timing, the siblings are going to rise. The kids, you know, uh, not so much. I would say. So again, that gives a first indication. I wouldn't go just on this, but you can see that it's collaborating with what I saw in the solar eclipse chart as well as in um, uh, King Charles's chart. Okay, so then I looked at, then my mind went to what do, if if we're thinking, you know, Queen Anne, and I, I didn't consider um, uh, Prince um, Andrew, one, because he, you know, he's been in some trouble and he's kind of, you know, basically kind of been pushed off to the side because of trouble he's got, personal trouble he's gotten into. I don't think they're going to put him in, in you know, in, in the seat of power, even though um, based on the line of succession, you know, he should because he's higher up in the list. But because of things he's been involved in, they're not going to, they might give him, you know, behind the scenes more things to do, but I don't think they're going to put him, you know, in the spotlight here. But I think Queen Anne, I think that leads Queen Anne. So I looked at Queen Anne and then I looked at Prince William because you know, those are, I think, the two uh, potential candidates, um, you know, here that King Charles is uh, considering. So this is Prince uh, William's chart, uh, King Charles' son, and Prince Anne's chart, his sister. Um, so again, you know, I can't go too deep into this, otherwise we'll be here all day. <laughs> but um, just to get a glance at Prince William's chart, um, he was born June 21st, 1982, 21.03 p.m. in London, England. The day lord is moon and the hurrah lord is Jupiter. Okay, so his moon, <laughs> so talk about eclipses and uh, monarchy. Uh, Prince William was born on a solar eclipse. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, right? I mean, when you see it like this, it's like one after the other, right? So Prince William was born on a solar eclipse. Um, the thing, though, is that his moon, um, uh, one, is an Ardra nakshatra, which is um, 
a stormy type of nature. Um, it's ruled by Rudra, the god of storms, you know, in terms of the deity associated with it. And also the moon is eclipsed. The moon is not going to be strong. Sun is eclipsed. Sun is not going to be strong. So mother, mom and dad, um, even though there's some uh, ambition here with Rahu, um, there's a lack of strength. And this is all in the seventh house of, you know, independent business and partnership. So for, you can see with Prince William, there's a shift here, I think, from where in Prince Charles's chart, it was about preserving the family line. You can see there's a shift here with um, seeing this a little bit more like a business than a corporation. Um, but the moon, because it's, you know, eclipsed, it's not going to be strong and it's stormy and sadness. There's sadness here. The other thing is that Jupiter or the, um, or the ascendant, um, Lugna is in Mula. Mula is about destruction. Um, it's a destructive energy. It's kind of like planting seeds, but this like, there's this growth that's happening, but it's like, a it's not a, you know, a solidified position. It's like a transformation process, but not solidified. Um, so there's a lot of rockiness to it. Um, and it can also, it can sometimes uh, bring in like a, I've seen in people's chart a bit of a self-destructive quality to it. Um, so um, the other thing is that, um, what is it here? Um, we have K2 here, which I've been talking about. Um, so we have, K and, and Mars is aspecting here. So this is, this can be an explosive energy. Um, you know, again, I, I don't mean to demean anybody, but if we're just looking at charts, you know, if we didn't know this is Prince William, I would say this is somebody who's, um, probably a very, um, can be at times explosive person, an end study person, um, a sad, uh, mood issues, I would say, um, and can be kind of, um, unsteady. Um, this isn't, this doesn't give me, um, a, a Lugna or chart is studying us here. Um, and K two is in Porvo Bhadrapada, so again, that's a that's a symbolized by a, a winnowing basket, like a moving back and forth. So again, there's a you know a lot of moving, shifting energies here uh, for um, Prince William. Um, so I think that you know this could be maybe somebody who's like touchy, if nothing else. And then Mars aspecting here. Um, this can be sometimes, you know, again, um, Mars is also a bit of a erratic uh, energy here. K2 here too, um, sometimes K2, I've see, you can see Rahu and K2 a lot in people's charts who are actually actresses and um, actors and models and stuff like that. Because they're kind of, um, you know, they're, um, they're hiding themselves. There's a camouflage here, which again, Rahu and K2 um, have a hidden energy to it. So... He may be, if he's got this much in steadiness, but he's first in line to be king, I think he takes him a lot of energy to maintain a steady uh, public image, is what I'm saying here. So, you know, again, I, I don't mean to disparage anybody, I'm just uh, looking at the energies here. So I'm seeing, you know, again, with Day Lord, Our Lord, sadness and sensitivity. Um, his birth to Shah was Rahu, Saturn, Venus. So again, he was born with this ambition, but um, in the direction of independent business. Um, Saturn here. <clears throat> um, aspects also the seventh house uh, from the tenth house. So, you know, creating order here. Um, even though you can see, like, for him, he, you know, Mars is creeping up on Saturn uh, in a couple of weeks after his birth. They will be in planetary war, like the color, um, upcoming solar eclipse. So that's going to be, again, more unsteadiness with what those planets represent and also um, <clears throat> uh, the houses that they own. Um, and again, Mars coming up against uh, Saturn, this is going to be a clash with tradition. Um the other thing is that Saturn and Mars here in the 10th house of daily activity, this is somebody who's going to be much more mechanical in the way that they approach uh, their daily activity. So um, again, with him growing into the potentially king position, um, 
over time, I, I don't think it's a natural fit for him, I guess, is, is what I can see. Um, you know, there's drive and there's structure, but in, in kind of different directions, uh, at least than the previous generations, um, even his father. Um, and then we have Venus here. Um, Venus is in its own sign in the sixth house, um, and then there's Mercury here. So I think he does have some notion of, again, uh, uh, maintaining appearances uh, for uh, the sake of, of um, you know, not letting people kind of um, capitalize on his unsteadiness, is what I'm seeing here. Um, and then the thing is, is that the Mercury, so the Lord of the seventh house, where he's got, again, got a Braha Raja, his focus is on the third house, uh, the seventh house here. It's in a negative house, um, but it is uh, strengthened a little bit by Venus um, being here. So actually, I, I think that this is um, his wife, um, Kate Middleton, <clears throat> who he actually um, um, supports in many ways. Uh, um, what he's trying to do and the position that he's in and the duties that he has assigned to him. So the current Disha period for Prince William is Saturn, Rahu, Jupiter. So you can see Saturn and Rahu again. Again, there's a drive here to the seventh house, uh, Jupiter um, here. I believe, oh, that was the other thing is Jupiter is also in Swati, Nakshatra. So Swati nakshatra is sort of like um, the Mula nakshatra. Mula is a little bit more, um, I would say, destructive. Jupiter is like, um, uh, Swati nakshatra is like uh, newborn grass blowing in the wind. So he's kind of got, again, like growing seeds. Like there's a lot of development here, but they're not established seeds. They're not established. So, you know, so, and... When I see Jupiter, uh, when I see planets in Jupiter for people's charts, I tend to see a lot of nervousness and restlessness. So it also kind of compounds this idea that, you know, there's like mood and unsteadiness with him. Um, the moon, nakshatra, I already talked about ardor, sadness, um, the context. He was born in solar eclipse. So I'm, again, I'm seeing a lot of like social anxiety and mood stuff for him. Um, the other thing is that he has a Mercury dominated chart. Um, he's got. Um, one, two, three, four, five planets in uh, Gemini and um, uh, Virgo here. Um, Mercury is also with uh, Venus here. So Mercury is influencing, uh, you know, six planets. So seven planets are very mercurial. So, and Mercury is a very dual planet. Um, and and these, uh, these, uh, these, these other planets are, are in dual signs. So um, yeah, that's also going to offer another level of kind of unsteadiness or, um, you know, back and forth energy for him. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing is, you know, I, I, I don't mean, again, I, I don't mean to demean Prince William at all. I actually, when I see people with, um, who are born in eclipses, um, that's a lot of energy, strong energy to handle. Um, and some people... Um, handle it well and other people it's it can be um just so much to deal with you know and, and that's what I feel like is going on for Prince William so my uh I do feel for this guy um considering the position and and duties and public scrutiny and anything and everything he's under um um with with this type of energy uh it's even for anybody it would be a hard job and for him I think it's um even more so um so yeah, the other thing is with Mercury, you know, that's the, um, you know, that's a planet of logic and analysis and also decision making. So, um, with it being, um, um, so many planets in that sign, I think he may have a hard time making decisions, um, clear cut decisions. Um, and I think a lot of his decision making is based on like a kind of a defensive stance with like trying not to like gain enemies or at least not um enemies because you know he's going to be under public scrutiny and you know skewered left and right um that's just unfortunately our day and age um especially with the internet and stuff but um i think with him he's trying not to you know again let people see um 
um, how sensitive uh, and potentially unsteady he can be because they would people just you know as if he isn't enough you know ripped apart um i think uh, people would just you know have a field day with that so that's kind of his general energy and then if we look at princess anne as a contrast so again if you're thinking of this you know again i'm sort of putting myself in the mind of king charles you know uh and then also as an astrologer <laughs> so if king charles is privy to this kind of information when he was looking at these potential two candidates to support him through a transition of the monarchy. Now, if we look at Princess Anne, uh, we can see a lot of sharp contrast to Prince William's chart. So 15th August, 1950 is when she was born, 11.50 in the morning, London, England. The day lord, Mars. So um, you can see uh, um, energy, uh, leadership energy, and it's right here in her Lugna. So right off the bat. And then Jupiter um, also aspecting her um, Lugna here. And Jupiter is about leadership and charity, uh, justice. So she's got that energy coming in. So she's coming from more of a philosophical position. Jupiter can also be philosophy in terms of leadership, like the philosophical um, position of duties. Um, the other thing, oh, that's another thing. So uh, the ruling planet for Plumps Williams chart is Jupiter, and it's gone to the 11th house of comma, of enjoyment. Um, Princess Anne here, um, her ruling planet is Venus, and it's gone to the 10th house of Arta, like wealth building. Right, so um, you can see she's going to be already a uh, more grounded uh, person here. Um, her birth to Shah was Venus, Jupiter, K2. So again, uh, lighting up her Lugna since Venus was her ruling planet and Jupiter aspecting here. So a lot of, all, you know, goodwill coming from her. And K2, K2 though, uh, is in the 12th house here, so loss. So she was born into loss. Um in K2, I want to say, I don't remember what nakshatra it's in, but, um, you know, this I could see as being, you know, um, despite, as we'll go through her skill set um, and drive um, and stuff like that, and goodness, you know, she was passed over simply for being female because of the laws that were in place. So, you know, she had losses just born, you know, as she was born, just... Um, you know, for being, you know, female. Um, the thing that was, you can also see that K2 here, um, uh, that could also, in the 12th class, that could also be like charity. So that would actually compound the charity and compassion aspect I'm seeing. Because Venus and Jupiter, that's a lot of compassion and charity for this woman. The current Desha, she's running. Hold on, I need a drink here. The current Desha she's running is Saturn, Sun slash Moon, um, which she will be running Sun, sorry, Saturn, Sun, Saturn, Moon until October. So you can see uh, Saturn is tradition and duty, and um, Sun, Moon um, is also um, like, you know, king and queen. And you can see that um, there's a parivartana between sun and moon here in her 10th uh, house of uh, daily activities and uh, fame, as well as her 11th house of groups, clubs, and societies. Um, and so you can see that basically sun, moon, and Saturn are all here in the 11th house. Um so the next, you know, six months is all is going to be about picking up even more of a load. And again, I think I mentioned I, what I'd read was that she's the most active uh, working royal member family. She's going to pick up even more of the slack, it looks like, over the next, you know, six months. Excuse me. Um, yeah, so, and again, I think picking up the slack is this, you know, stepping into more duties because her brother is ill. The Lugna Nakshatra is Chitra. It's about um, structure. It's You can think of it as a gemstone. The symbol there is a gemstone. So the facets, you know, create a lot of like structure and architecture type energy. But it's also a gemstone. Like, you know, I think she's a, she's a you know, uh, like almost like the jewel, a crown jewel here is what I'm seeing. 
Um, I've never looked at Prince Andrew's chart, but I'm guessing it's a, a much different chart than hers. Um, but this is looking, you know, pretty good here. Um, the moon nakshatra is in Porva Falguni. Um, so it's about enjoying the finer things of life. So the moon has gone to the 11th house here of clubs, groups, and society. I mean, this is somebody who's a socialite. You know, hobs knobs and rubs elbows with very um, high-level, influential, and uh, wealthy people. Um, which you would imagine for a princess, right? Um, British princess. Um, for her, um, she was born a month before a solar eclipse. <laughs> she wasn't too far off. So the eclipse energy was building uh, in her chart. And you can kind of see like the planets sliding. And even the sun here, within another day or so, is going to be, she's going to have this Pravaraja yoga in the 11th house. So she's all about like clubs, groups, societies, and speaking and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. That's all in her chart here. Um, the Parivartana Yoga I mentioned between sun and moon, the exchange of houses. So her daily activity is going to be about all these like uh, uh, um, appointments and announcements and um, charitable physicians and uh, speeches and things that she gives. But it's going to be a very royal type of way of doing it, a very charitable way of doing it. She's going to be a workhorse with this Jupiter Mars energy. She's somebody who's very active and enthusiastic. Um, uh, and then I have war here, whatever. Oh, there is war here, though. Um, Saturn and Mercury, um, they are in the same degree. So there is a war going on here. So um, I think, though, with her skill set, I think she's really good at smoothing things over when, you know, things are not going well. So when there's like a social media crisis or a personal crisis in the family, I think she's one to step up and help smooth things over and get the work done. So, um, so again, just a contrast of two potential candidates, uh, potentially for the British monarchy. Um, then what I did was I wanted to see, based on the current Deshaw period that Prince William's running and the current Deshaw period that Princess Anne is running, I wanted to look at the subzodiacs for one uh, career and fame because this is going to show me in the next you know bit of time here um, which you know the kids are they going to be you know catapulting up in their career and fame or uh, potentially more likely is Princess Anne going to be catapulting up and so. <laughs> Um, you can see there's a huge difference here between these two uh, D10s, Desh Deshamsha. This is the career and fame. The first one is the Prince William. The current Desha period for him is Saturn, Rahu, Jupiter. So those are the set period planets we want to look at in his Deshamsha of career and fame. You can see all three of those planets are in the 12th house of loss, and it's a negative house. There is some you know, um, salvaging here because at least Jupiter is in its own sign. That's going to help Jupiter a little bit so that there's not so much like material loss. The other thing is Rahu is here. So um, Rahu, the dispositor of Rahu, which is Jupiter, is strong. So that's going to help uh, Rahu a lot. Um, but again, all three planets in a negative house. I mean, if you've seen any of my videos, you haven't seen this yet. This is quite unusual, like very strong. The other thing is that the Lugna here is Saturn. Um, Saturn has gone to this 12th house here. And uh, you do have Mars aspecting, but you know, the tenth, uh, the Lugna here where it's exalted, but um, he's not running Mars and will not be running Mars, you know, as a Desha period for the rest of his life because he's got to go through Saturn and then Mercury. Those are long Deshas. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, he's going to be running Saturn and then Mercury, even if, you know, the next, uh, Mahadasha for him is, is Mercury. Mercury's not in a, you can see for, uh, the, um, D10 for Prince William, he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, six out of, um, nine planets in negative houses here. So, you know, um, you know, maybe the D10 is not correct, but if the D10 is correct for him, um, uh, this isn't going to be a great moment in time for him. Um, there's going to be a lot of loss, uh, 
potentially, and also Mercury is aspecting this uh, 10th house and the 6th, Mercury is the Lord of the uh, ninth house of Father and also Authority. So, and Jupiter here. Um, and then Jupiter, you know, is the Lord of his uh, third house of sibling, and, you know, he and his brother are not, you know, in, in a good place right now. It's, I think, public knowledge, so. So, yeah, I mean, again, if this is a correct D10 for Prince William, this is not a great moment in time for him. Um, which, you know, again, if his wife is ill and all this sort of thing, uh, that makes sense, right? So, um, then Princess Anne, by contrast, so Princess Anne's current to shop period, she's running Saturn, Venus, Rahu. So, if we look at those, so one, first of all, her Deshamsha, um, of the D10 of career and fame is a Virgotama Lugna. It's the same rising sign as her birth chart. This is our, this already gives strength to her D10, her career. And now in direct contrast, all of the Grahas for her, Saturn, Venus, and Rahu are all positively placed in her chart. And um, not only that, but Venus is aspecting her Lugna. That's gonna be, bring even more strength to um, her D10. She has Saturn aspect, even though Saturn is debilitated in the seventh house here, uh, Saturn is aspecting uh, the Lugna, which is Virgo, or not Virgo, Libra, and Saturn is exalted here. Oops. Um, and these are the planets she's running. Um, she has also Mercury um, aspecting uh, the Lugna here. So she's got three planets aspecting the Lugna directly. The other thing is she has a Parivartana Yoga between Mars and Saturn. So even though Saturn looks debilitated here, um, it's it, you can bring it back to the fourth house where it's going to be a, a swa um, in the fourth house of family. And Mars is going to come here to uh, the seventh house of partnerships. She's going to be somebody, again, again, we're seeing adept at building very strong um, relationships. So she actually has Venus, Sun, uh, Venus, Saturn, Mercury, and Mars all aspecting her Lugna of D10 career and fame. Um, you see the difference here. I mean, this is quite stark. <laughs> so that's again why, you know, this is more potential astrological evidence that it might things might go her way. And again, I don't know that she's going to be given full rights and, 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 uh, things um that might be upsetting the apple cart too much the other thing is she's you know she's up there in years herself i mean so i think it might be like how do we kind of create a better support transition from where things are now with king charles through princess anne to princess william that's what i'm seeing here so again princess anne being kind of the training wheels to support and guide prince william and his development um, and just can't kind of maybe take the load off even temporarily if, again, Prince William right now is uh, potentially sinking a little bit here. Um, you know, he hasn't been seen in uh, even the usual things, events that he's seen at because of things that are going on for him. Um, also, this Mars-Saturn, uh, you know, uh, Parivartana, again, making her industrious, uh, very much like the natal chart for her. Um, so again, with all this, this is somebody who's committed to work, compassion, relationship building. I mean, this is, yeah, that's a big contrast. Um, Prince Anne in a much stronger position. Then for them, I also wanted to look at another point of, uh, you know, just getting more information to potentially build a case here. Um, their Akadamsha D11. So the D11 um, is about income, but also social support. Let's see what's going on here. So again, Prince William is currently running Saturn, Rahu, Jupiter. And you can see Saturn and Jupiter, again, are not well placed. Um, there is a Parivartana between Sun and Saturn, which will make things a little bit better. But again, they're not well placed. And Saturn is his main Mahadasha. So either way, Saturn is in a negative house. Um, Rahu is... Um, you know, again, uh, there's some attempts at, you know, um, in the seventh house here of, you know, spouse, independent business. So 
And this is also a, a recreation of the, the Rahu position, is a at least in the same house as his natal chart. So I think he's still trying to be strategic here about putting his efforts, his his mind and his mind. It's you know this is kind of a corporation and uh, and so he. But the Rahu here is going to bring all sorts of like you know unexpected twists and turns in the seventh house matters like spouse and partnership, business partnerships, and independent business. So again, not a very strong position for Prince William. But then Princess Anne. She's running against Saturn, Venus, Rahu. Uh, Venus is not well placed, but it is exalted in, in the twelfth house, so um, there will be some protection here. Um, Saturn. Um, well, the whole Lugna is actually protected; is strong because Mars is aspecting its own sign. The other thing is Saturn is aspecting the tenth house of career and fame. Um, so Saturn is swa there, Mars is there, where Mars is ex is uh, exalted, and then there's Jupiter. This is again like workhorse energy. Um, you know, there's fame here. Um, and the other thing is Rahu. She's running. Rahu is um, we don't usually use a Rahu uh, exaltation in the natal chart, but Rahu is exalted here in the eleventh house of of you know clubs, groups, and society, public support. So. You know, even though Venus is not uh, well placed, uh, Saturn and Rahu are doing a lot for Princess Anne here in her D11. Um, oh, and though even though Jupiter is, um, you know, uh, debilitated here because Mars is there, Mars is the exalted planet in the in the constellation where Jupiter is debilitated. Uh, Jupiter is going to be Bunga. So Jupiter, even though it's debilitated, is not going to be as weak as it might look initially. And she does also have a Parivartana Yoga between, um, you know, fourth house and the sixth house with Mercury and Moon. So that's going to be strength to the fourth house of family and strength to the sixth house of like dealing with enemies and acute issues and stuff like that. You know, again, it's just her whole, you know, through these different, you can see subcharts and everything. You keep seeing the same stuff. With Princess Anne, and uh, you know, again, it's a clearly stronger position so far from the natal chart in the D10 and D11. So I think that's why she might be brought forward a bit. It's not quite a lot because of uh, the situation with uh, Prince uh, King Charles. So then, what did I look? At? Then I wanted to bring it full circle. So then I went back to the solar eclipse chart because that's where we started. And we went through King Charles' chart to see where he's at, and then we started looking a little bit at, you know, uh, Prince William and Princess Anne. And now it's just like, okay, let's now look at, knowing what we know so far, now let's go to the solar eclipse, so this moment in time, collectively, and look at the sub-zodiacs for children and siblings to see, you know, what is that? Does that change anything from what I was getting initially from the natal chart of the solar eclipse? And then what we were seeing consistently through King Charles's chart, his Amshas, and then uh, Prince William and Princess Anne. So let's take a look. So again, the the solar eclipse to Shah. So, you know, you got to keep making sure that you're clear on which to Shah. So the solar eclipse current Shah period is Mercury, Rahu, Mercury, Jupiter. So remember that like sudden unexpected announcement energy. So the Septamsha D7 for children, this is important. Look, so you have a Virgoda Malugna. You have the same rising sign as as uh, the needle chart for the solar eclipse, so that makes this chart important. But uh, you can see Rahu and uh, Jupiter are not well placed here. Um, at least uh, Rahu is swa. That gives some strength here, but you can see it's like uh, uh, it's in the eighth house of loss, death, a chronic illness, and sun and moon are here. So you can see like um, uh, there's almost like a um, obsessive energy because Rahu and Moon together can be like obsessive energy on like um, death and illness. So again, this could be you know the health of the parents, sun and moon. Um, it could also be um, again this transition thing that's going on. And you can also see that basically there's an eclipse. Basically, you're you're getting another eclipse happening in this D7 chart on the 
uh, two eight axes. So two, the second house being a family and uh, or the eighth house being loss. So, you know, that's tough. And then um, what else do we have? Um, uh, you do have a Parivartana. Oh, okay, so <laughs> you do have a Parivartana between um, Mercury and uh, Mars here. But, you know, in a way that kind of uh, decreases the strength that Mercury is bringing because it brings Mercury to a negative house um, where uh, you have a Saturn here. Um, so that might bring some protection of like physical things, you know, like maybe assets and stuff like that. But um, you're actually going to bring this Mercury down. Even it's the only planet that's on a positive house here. Um, so, again, uh, more loss. You know, Mercury, you know, thinking about more loss here. Um, and then with Mars being shifted here, um, now you see all these red arrows. Uh, Mars can be a, is a fiery planet. It can bring a lot of anger. So I can see, I can see where the, you know, the, the children are not happy here. Um, but, you know, again, we're not seeing sadness energy here. Sadness would be more... Um, Saturn, but we're seeing more um, obsessive, angry type energy here with children. Yeah, so it, it brings a more hawkish type of mindset here. Um, I think the you know plus point, you know, not to make this all negative. Uh, I think the plus point though is that I think the strength for kids here, if we're talking about like kids, like you know specifically King Charles's kids, so Prince William and Prince Harry. The strength that they could find uh, with this Mercury Mars situation here is they could derive leadership because Mars would come into Aries here. They could develop leadership here. But the Mercury going to the 12th house, this would be like they would develop leadership. I think what maybe the princes, you know, that kid, King Charles's kids are good at, maybe not in the same way that like Princess Anne is where she's like the you know, rock, you know, the central rock, you know, to keep the whole foundation operation steady. I think they're good at going out, you know, abroad and creating relationships abroad and, you know, shaking people with hands abroad and that sort of thing. That seems to be their strength. That's what they're good at is what I'm seeing here. So if we're talking about like, you know, you know, some of us who, you know, aren't at that level, if we're talking about our own children, you know, um, what this would mean is that um, uh, the kids would potentially derive um, strength through travel and through also um, actually isolating a bit because the 12th house can be places of isolation. And with Mercury going to its own um, sign here with Saturn, especially, and Mars, this would be like meditation. So that's where the children, you know, again, specifically King Charles children, but children in general from the solar eclipse energy, that's where they can create strength and, and leadership for themselves, even if it's, if it's not the leadership that they anticipated. They are meant for leadership, but it's different from, I think, the kind that they have in mind, um, at least for now, right, during this current period. Then if we look at the Drake and the E3, so again, we're looking at planets Mercury, Rahu, Mercury, Jupiter. Again, this probably isn't surprising at this point. All three of these planets are well placed. So a much stronger position for siblings in general. King Charles's siblings as well as, you know, any of us, right? So the Lagnatia um, is ruled by Jupiter, and Jupiter is Swa here in its own sign in the tenth house. So again, this is a different kind of leadership energy. This is leadership through charitable giving and speaking and generosity. I think I've mentioned in many of my videos, Jupiter is like a Santa Claus energy. Whereas like the, the children energy is much more of like a, you know, fight by might type of energy. Um, you can also get into this kind of energy, like, you know, uh, vying for position, like a very competitive type of energy here. And even with like the brothers, right? Princess, uh, Prince, Prince, Prince William and Prince Harry. I mean, that's kind of what's going on with them. And it has been going for them for, for a number of years now, right? Um, some, some kind of falling out. I mean, some kind of loss even between them 
their speech and their thoughts about each other. You can see that here. Um, but, um, you know, the siblings here are, 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 are motivated by a much different thing. They, they, the siblings here are motivated by, they know they come from a place of privilege and they see it as a sacred and honorable duty to share goodwill, be sort of, you know, good, this is more about being goodwill ambassadors here with siblings. Like they're very clear, clear about this. And you can see that, you know, the, the gift here, whereas there's, there's struggles with communication, Jupiter's in struggle here, Mercury's in struggle here with the kids, Jupiter swa, that's a oration, you know, oral communication. And Mercury, you can see Jupiter and Mercury are both in the second house of family and oral communication. So you can see that the siblings are much more well-spoken here. We do also have a Mercury Mars, uh, you know, party of Archana with the siblings here. We're going to bring leadership through like speech and communication here with the siblings, as opposed to, excuse me, like more of a manufacturing energy. Like I think the the kids, you know, King Charles's kids, um, have gotten up in this whole kind of more modern you know, Instagrammy type life of projecting images and kind of shadows on the wall and and kind of grabbing things as opposed to, you know, this being like, you know, give because you've been given to. You know, my cup is overflowing. How, who's 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 whose other, you know, cups can I fill? That's where Princess Anne is coming from. Um Anyway, you know, again, not disparaging, you know, and, and again, there's there's leadership here and there's goodness here, but it's it's like a different flavor, different kind, different brand. Um, and then what else? Um, yeah, I mean, even if you look at the, not to belabor the point too much, but even if you look at the, you know, kids uh, sub zodiac here for the solar eclipse, the the ruling planet is moon. The moon is gone you know, to the eighth house, it's gone to a negative house with two other malefics, sun being a uh, leadership and Rahu being like an obsessive energy. You can see this like, this is like a black hole of obsessive energy here. Um, whereas like you can see Rahu even, it's with, you also have the eclipse reformed here in the siblings, which again, <laughs> you're recreating the natal chart of the solar eclipse, through the siblings chart, you have Moon, Sun, and you have Rahu here. Rahu is in, you know, leadership energy, positive leadership energy. Um, yeah, you also have in in the in the um, eighth house here of siblings. You have Saturn exalted. This is going to be, you know, steadiness here. Okay, what else? Um. There may be some suddenness of speech, though, especially in this moment, because with Mars aspecting <clears throat> into the second house, that's going to be leadership energy, suddenness energy. And you have Saturn here aspecting the second house of where it's debilitated. But because you have Mars there also, that's going to be uh, ameliorated a bit. But again, there's a restructuring here of family. And the and the, again the line here with the siblings, and this Saturn Mars Jupiter um, energy here because Saturn is aspecting the tenth house. Mars is aspecting the tenth. This Mars Saturn Jupiter energy is basically similar to Princess Anne's D eleven, right? Because also the Saturn is a lord of the eleventh house of public. So you can see the Lord has gone to an exalted house here. There's deep thought here about, you know, again, the public and, and charity here um, with the siblings subchart. And then, um, you know, there's still ambition here, though, um, with, you know, stepping up into a, a royal monarch position. So, um, again, um, you know, at least with King Charles, we might be seeing some notice of this sort of energy in the upcoming weeks, especially. Um, 
and then you can see how um you know you can put bits and pieces together from different people's charts to see where the flow of energy might be going over time all right so there you go i think that's i think that's all i have yes that's all i have but that's funny <laughs> that's annoying. Losing my voice here. Anyway, as always, I really appreciate you stopping by and listening to one of my talks, especially when I go on and on for <laughs> I'm kind of surprised uh, at how much uh, I can talk uh, about astrology, but I love it. So I guess uh, that's my passion for the subject. Um, if you're interested in learning um, more about Vedic astrology, all of my uh, teaching videos on the subject are my concepts playlist. Um, if you're interested in individual birth chart readings, I do offer those. Um, I offer them live on Zoom or I do pre-recorded video. If you're interested in more info about that, you can email hotplanaster at yahoo.com. I have another YouTube channel on natural medicine, um, and I include um, videos about other Vedic arts, such as Ayurveda, traditional Indian medicine and yoga, as well as other paradigms of natural medicine, like coming up with the naturopathic medicine, and the name of that channel is Nature Source Care. So again, I want to thank you for stopping by for this talk, but in general, um, I really appreciate all the support that you give me and the work I do and the channel, um, all the people subscribing, all the people liking, all the people sharing videos, you know, um, um, you know, writing nice comments and things like that. Um, I really appreciate all of that. Um, and I hope, as always, that you find uh, the things that I talk about uh, in these videos uh, to be helpful and useful and interesting to you as you navigate the energy cycles of your own life. All right, so um, all the best through the eclipse and the energy is moving forward. All right, take care. Namaste.